What are the dire consequences of the cultural norming of transgenderism is the treatment of children who express confusion about their biological sex. At younger and younger ages, they are being encouraged to take part in what are called transition-affirming treatments that may be emotionally and physically damaging, and in some cases, irreversible. The evidence suggests that advocates of such treatments are more committed to a politically correct agenda than to science, or what is ultimately good for children. Because when it comes to children, here are three key facts those promoting the transgender agenda ignore. Number one, despite what you often hear, scientific evidence shows people are not born trapped in the body of the wrong sex. If transgenderism were biological, then studies of identical twins should prove that. But instead, they show just the opposite. In a 2013 study of transgender twins, the largest of its kind, only 28% of the time did both identical twins, who contain 100% of the same DNA and are exposed to the same prenatal hormones, identify as transgender. That means that over 70% of the time, what contributed to one of the twins deciding they were the opposite sex of what they were born had nothing to do with biology. Number two. After passing through puberty, the majority of young children who originally expressed distress and confusion about their biological sex outgrew it. We're talking 75 to 95 percent of such children. But with the widespread push to embrace and affirm transgenderism, perhaps it shouldn't be surprising that more children are questioning their gender. In the United Kingdom, for example, a government-affiliated health service dealing in gender identity issues for those under the age of 18 experienced a 2,000% increase in patient referrals since 2009. For children under the age of 6, the referrals have increased by over 400%. Number three, medical treatments often used to treat children with gender dysphoria have not been proven safe. Serious questions remain including whether such treatments may cause obesity and testicular cancer in males, and decrease bone and muscle growth and infertility in both sexes. No rigorous scientific studies exist to show the long-term physical or psychological effects of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormone treatments on normally developing children. None. The rush by the media, cultural elites, and politically correct medical organizations to normalize and embrace transgenderism has no time for fact-finding. So much for science, and so much for having the best interest of children at heart. Parents beware. Aren't those numbers staggering? The study showed a 2,000% increase of patient referrals for people under the age of 18 questioning their gender, and for those under the age of six, the referrals have increased by 400%. That's not some crazy biological change sweeping through the land. That is societal changes. A number of factors are contributing to the increase of the number of children and teens who are struggling to accept their, their sex, or what the world now calls gender. And the evidence suggests that transgender identities are heavily influenced by social contagion, mental health issues, popular culture, and current trends in medical treatment so readily available. Young people are often exposed to transgender ideas on social media or websites like YouTube, TikTok, Tumblr. They feature, but especially, especially YouTube. You guys, be watchful of that, YouTube. They find thousands of very popular videos of teens documenting their hormonal and surgical transformation. They even teach the kids how to pick out a new name, step by step. Parents of trans-identified kids reported a recent study that YouTube and Tumblr and TikTok acted as a powerful influence on their child and that their child had increased their use of social media just before announcing their new trans identity. So when I speak to parents and they, they tell me that their, their child seemingly out of the blue just told them they're, they're transgender and they're identifying as, as the opposite 
sex. I'll ask this parent uh, two questions. Well, three, how old are they? And if, if the child is between the ages of 11 and 20, I ask them two questions. Do they watch anime and are they on the spectrum? 95% of the time, the parents say, yes, they watch anime. How did you know? And then for me personally, in my own situations, between 30 and 40% of the time, their child is somewhere on the spectrum. Young people with autism or autistic traits and ADHD are overrepresented at gender clinics. Nine large-scale studies have found almost without exception Rates of autism or autistic traits range from 5% to 54% among those with gender dysphoria, significantly higher among the general population. And we can dig more into that, why I think that is when we have times of Q&A. So it's estimated that roughly 1% to 2% of the general population meets the criteria of autism. And then similarly, studies suggest that children with ADHD are six to seven times more likely to present with gender dysphoria than children without ADHD. Brothers and sisters, this should break our hearts so much that it actually drops us to our knees in prayer daily. This is our kids. And hasn't Satan since the beginning tr been trying to attack and keep this perfect victory of God uh, from, from happening, which he can't, but he keeps trying. That's just idiosity but he's always attacking our children because when you get the kids, you get a whole generation. We need to pray that the Lord would bring victory over the deception that our children are being inundated with in society and especially schools. So I'm just gonna share with you today uh, briefly about my gender confusion, which eventually became severe dysphoria, so that you, you can hear it from a personal account and, and that you will know that I understand it when I share some of what I share. I'll explain some definitions or terms so you won't feel lost in the conversation, and it's this much of this many terms that I'll be sharing. Then I'll share what the Bible has to say about gender, or what we used to call sex, uh, until just recently, and I'm sure most of you know that, so I'll keep that brief. And then I'll provide biblical ways for us to walk alongside those who have gender confusion. And then I'll share some helpful ways to deal with this phenomenon that's happening in our schools. Urgh, that part gets me really upset. Um, so I just want to start with a question. I want to get personal with you. I'm getting personal. You guys got to get personal too, in your hearts. Have you ever questioned your sexual or gender identity? Have you ever felt like your mind doesn't um, declare what your body says? I can tell you firsthand, it is a horrible, horrible feeling. And yet it's a very real feeling and it doesn't just poof, go away, even when you come to the Lord. For me, it took years. It's devastating and it goes so deep. It's actually the, the core of your identity. It's the very place Satan wants to place seeds of deception because our heart is always receiving seeds, seeds of truth or seeds of deception, and whatever gets watered grows. And we have to be careful when we plant those seeds or someone else plants those seeds and we water, that we do it with a gentle little watering thing and not a fire hose. Because if we fire hose on these kids or folks in our life, uh, you know, like shoot too much of that watering of the word, it's going to blow the seeds away instead of gently hitting those seeds and therefore growing. So because I looked and acted the way I did when I was little, uh, others tried to give me an identity. And it was one that stuck because I, I felt like what they were declaring about me, like words I would hear uh, concerning myself were boy, son, tomboy, then eventually uh, lesbo and fag because they wanted to call me lesbian, but they saw me as a boy, so then they just started calling me fag. I mean, it was all these names being directed on me so that when I became an adult, I started my own self-proclaimed identity of gay, gender nonconformed, butch, dyke, dude, poppy. This is how I would self-identify. 
when I was eight years old, it was 1974, n not much talk was being uh, declared across the land concerning gender back then. So 1974, I was eight years old. Don't do the math, it's gonna distract you. 54, there you go, easy. Um, my mom took me to the doctor and said, hey, my daughter thinks she's a boy, what do I do? And the doctor's like, ah, don't worry about it. She'll grow out of it and make a fine wife someday. Well, I didn't grow out of it like the 85 to 90 percent, 85 to 95 percent of, of children do once they make it through puberty. I literally thought that I was a boy, not in a tomboy kind of way. My brain, every thought that went through my brain was what I thought going through the brain of a boy. So when I, I, I realized I wasn't a boy because of my anatomy, I became very angry and confused. Very. I didn't know how to deal with this. I hated my girl body. I hated it so much, so I started to self-injure at five years old. I did everything I could to mar this body that seemed to be lying to me. And then as I got a little bit older, just maybe a little pre-puberty or during puberty is when I realized I was really attracted to girls. And that confused me as well because I knew girls liking girls was wrong, but yet I felt like a boy, so was it really wrong? It's very confusing. I wanted to date girls and take on the masculine identity, but I actually never did that back then because of the abusive ridicule I knew I would have endured. And I had another, I had enough abuse going on. I couldn't, I couldn't handle any more. So I was very, very isolated and alone. There wasn't internet back there. The young man that shared, no, the gentleman, the pastor, I think the high school youth pastor shared last night, he was thankful that there wasn't internet back then. Me too. I'm so glad I couldn't go to Google and type in, how do you know you're gay? How do you know you're trans? Because a plethora of information would have come up and 95% of it would have been lies, but I would have believed it because it would have met me right there in my feelings. And that's what's happening to our kids. So because I was isolated and alone and I needed help, I started drinking and doing drugs at 12 years old, heavily, heavily sedating myself so that by the time I was probably 15, 16, I was a drug addicted al alcoholic. I tried uh, uh, dating someone after I got out of high school thinking that would help things. Um, I figured that's what society and my family expected of me and so I, at uh, 18 years old, entered into a relationship with a man, hoping that it would take all my sexual attraction and gender issues away, but it didn't. It actually made it worse. So I came out of the closet and started identifying as a gay, gender nonconformed person. And notice I said person, not woman. I didn't identify as a woman, even though sometimes I used the word lesbian. So it's very hard to navigate yourself when you're living a false identity, but it didn't feel false to me at the time. I didn't know how to be a woman, nor did I want to be. Yet I didn't fully take on the male identity either, even though I leaned more toward the masculine, and that's why I identified as gender nonconformed. I never felt like a woman, even when I had been intimate with a man. It made me feel more gender dysphoric. I was jealous of his body, wishing it were mine. And I say that not to share too much, um, but I say it so you know that pointing your kids to opposite sex relationships isn't what's going to cure them of their same-sex attraction or gender dysphoria. Please don't do that. Finding the deep-rooted issues and the deep-rooted pain and deception is what's going to bring clarity and healing. So now I was part of the LGBT community and I felt a sense of freedom to be whoever I wanted to be. But was I free? What actually makes someone free? Is freedom constituted by what someone feels or could that possibly be a delusion? Doesn't it feel like we're in the Second Thessalonians chapter 2, strong delusion days? My feelings were deceiving me, and yet I thought they were true, but that's how deception works, right? It wasn't until years later that I got saved when I realized how big of a role deception had on my life. It was crazy. 
And I'm so thankful the Lord saved me when he did in such a powerful way. And then the Lord showed me why I had gender confusion. I had a distorted perception of how men treated women, partly because of my parents' relationship. And this isn't me throwing my parents under the bus. It's just my story. I can't get away from it. So I share it. My father gave my mother a daily beatdown with his words. With his words. He thought it was funny. I thought it was true. Because my dad was speaking those words. So because of that, I believed all women were crazy and weak and worthless. The very words I heard my dad speak over my mother. So I detached from all things feminine because I didn't want to be weak and worthless which is what I now naturally associated with being a woman. I wanted to be strong and powerful and in control, which I thought being a boy or a man would bring me. Brothers and sisters, do you see the impact those words I heard in my home had on my life? Please be mindful of what you say and how you say it, especially in front of children. Even when you're talking about like for the past four, four years or whatever, time-wise, how often we were talking about the presidential election and we maybe had the TV on or maybe some of us were saying, I can't stand the president we have now. He's such a misogynist. Mommy, what's a misogynist? Oh, it's, it's, it's uh, where men overpower women or, or uh, you know, men that believe women don't get, shouldn't get paid as much. And, and so like sometimes our kids can hear us saying things like our little girls can be like, wait, I hear, you know, my mom talking to her friend on the phone and saying, you know what, it stinks that I don't get paid as much as a man. And then that little girl, that's just a little seed of deception. Like, well, I, I don't want to, I don't want to grow up and be paid less. I don't want to be looked down upon. Oh, let me go on the computer and find the new identity. And it's right there, right there, easy access. I was also being uh, sexually violated and thought that that was only happening to me because I actually had a female body. I didn't understand. I was very, very little. I desired to have male body parts to protect me from the violation. There was deep-seated reasons for my gender confusion. And so that's just a, a blip of my testimony. If you'd like to hear my full testimony, I have a table um, a resource table somewhere, I think it's out that way, with different, uh, I have uh, CDs and DVDs, remember those? <laughs> um, I have those available out there, and uh, just, we can help point you to my website out there, and you can listen to my full testimony there. So, uh, now that you know a little bit about me, I want to uh, uh, dig in. Um, I want to make sure that you understand what I'm saying, so I'm just briefly going to start with some terms um, that I've already used or that I'm going to introduce. And LGBT, it's just simply an acronym, a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Um, it used to be LGB until the early 90s. The T was added then at the dismay of many uh, of the L's. The lesbians didn't want transgender coming in and saying, look, I, I've worked hard to be this woman, and you're coming in now, Mr. Trans Man, and you're taking female identity. Mm. So it, it took a while for the T to be even comfortable in the LGBT community. Um, gender, now we're using the word gender instead of sex. It's very dangerous, you guys, because gender has four different definitions. It's used as a synonym for sex, the name given to sex stereotypes. It's used to describe the socio-cultural and behavioral aspects of sex. And it's the name of an ideology that claims bodily sex is irrelevant to human identity. And how gender has made its way in even our vocabulary when we talk about our sex. We don't say, oh, what sex are they? Don't we say now what gender are they? Or when we fill something out. Cisgender. Has anyone heard the term cisgender? Maybe some younger people. It's, uh, it's a term mostly used within the LGBT community. It's referring to people whose assigned birth gender, their bodies, match their personal gender identity. In other words, the way God created gender, but 
listen for it because you're going to start to hear that more and more. Oh, you're cisgender. You don't understand what I'm going through. You're comfortable with your mind-body relationship. It's a dangerous word for Christians because it denotes that there are others that aren't cisgender that can have a personal gender identity outside of how God created them. It's a word the LGBT community created, and you're going to start to hear it more. It's a very dangerous place that we've moved into to make sex, uh, uh, to replace gender as a descriptor instead of sex. Transgender is just a term that refers to people who wish to determine their identity based on their feelings instead of their sex. Gender dysphoria is when a person experiences significant distress or problems functioning associated with the conflict between the way they feel and think of themselves and their assigned sex, assigned gender. And you heard me use the word uh, gender nonconformed when identifying my former self. And this, along with non-binary, are terms describing self-expression that differs from the stereotypical norms for the sexes. And then just real quick, uh, gender fluid. You guys have probably heard that, right? Fluid is, is the new word. Everything can be fluid now, <clears throat> except <laughs> us. Gender fluid describes the nature of gender identity as a subjective, remember that word, as a subjective state of mind that can fluctuate on the spectrum in the same way feelings can. Feelings are dynamic in adults, but in children, they're even more likely to shift and are easily influenced by peers and their social environment. So our children are really the ones grasping the term gender fluid because they're so moved by their feelings. And if the Lord didn't deliver me out of my place of pain and deception, I'm sure I would have eventually come to actually fully identify as transgender because I was, I was right there anyways. <laughs> but God, I love the but gods, right? So I had a deep need to be accepted. And I think that's one of the reasons I didn't fully transition back then because there wasn't the acceptance that there is now. And that's one of the reasons, this acceptance, of why we're seeing the numbers of people who identify increase. So I chose gender nonconform because I didn't identify in the feminine, but I didn't fully identify as a man in the sense of taking hormone shots and stuff. I felt genderless in a sense. I wasn't conformed to society's description of either gender. However, my outward appearance, as well as my inner feelings and mannerisms were all very masculine. Even my voice was deeper because I taught it how. So this left me wide open to be verbally ridiculed and to be looked at with twisted faces of disgust and uncomfortable when using public bathrooms. Countless numbers of times I'd be, uh, I'd walk into the women's bathroom, walk in just to, to use the bathroom. I'd walk in and people would, the women would look at me like, dude, why, why are you in here? And then sometimes I would just go into a stall and then sometimes I would undo that deep voice that I created for myself and use the girl voice and just say like, hey, what's up? To let them know that I was a woman so that they wouldn't be uncomfortable. Or I'd be washing my hands and a woman would walk in, walk in and see me and go, oh, and then walk back out, look at the door, see ladies, and then kind of do one of these. And then instead of walking by me this way, they'd kind of go like this to get in their stall. That left me feeling so ashamed, so ashamed. I had no control over what I was feeling and, and, and experiencing. It was the manifestation of pain that I was showing on the outward. This pain on the inside was manifesting itself on the outside, and people were scared of me because of that. I just wanted to use the bathroom. I share that with you to let you know I wasn't some deviant. I was just not knowing what to do. I was just trying to get by in the day to day. And that's where a lot of people are that we might know in our lives. It's what felt natural to me. And, and I tried, I tried so hard conjuring up feminine ad, uh, attributes, but that made me feel like I was a liar. It was only after repenting and believing and receiving the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ that I was able to understand where my gender dysphoria came from. And even in that, it took years. 
I want you to hear this, you guys. I had to allow the Lord to take me back to where it began. Sometimes you have to look backwards to move forwards. Sometimes you have to look backwards to move forwards. So as I was growing in my relationship with the Lord, he began to reveal to me how much damage different types of trauma had on me and how that led me to a false proclaimed identity. So I have a Native American heritage, and we know that many tribes were able to track people to see where they had been, where they had walked, to get an indication of where they were headed. And the Lord took me on a journey and allowed me to see how the tracks or footsteps of my childhood pain put me on a track of deception. If you don't recognize how your past steps were off the path, you won't realize why you're not on the right path now, even as a Christian. So the Lord is intentional with his creation. We know that, right? And his intentions are good. God's intentions are always good. He created us male and female with a specific intention to bring forth more life created in his image, which brings him glory. So as I was asking God where my same-sex attraction came from, he began showing me how my perception of certain events in my childhood led me to be deceived, even in my feelings and attractions, or I should say especially, especially in my feelings and therefore attractions. So with that, we need to pray and ask the Lord where our child has been hurt, broken, or deceived. And it's not always easy as a parent to hear the answer. But we have to, for the sake of our child, pray and fast and ask the Lord to reveal to you where your child has been hurt, broken, or deceived. And you might know already some of it, but there's probably stuff that you don't know. Sometimes it's emotional, physical, or sexual trauma. Sometimes it's mental health issues. Sometimes it's peer influence, and it's always, always, if I was texting, I would put in all caps, always, rejection, whether it's real or perceived. So we know how God created us, male and female, and we see the creation account in Genesis chapter 1, and we are part of that creation. God created all things, and he has the authority over everything, including us, and he should, because he is the creator. Genesis 1, 26 through 28 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Again, Genesis 5, 2 says he created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. It's very, very clear in God's word, the entirety of God's word, that there's only male and female and he has a plan and a purpose for those whom he created in his own image and likeness. The Bible is written with a heterosexual male and female specific narrative and nothing else. The only time the Bible talks about sex outside of male and female being together, whether it's the godly marital kind or the we read about rape a lot in the Bible, but even that's male and female. Everything is male and female in the Bible only. There's nothing more and nothing less. And the Bible itself correlates sex and gender. There's never any other gender talked about other than male or female. Gender is not fluid and we don't get to pick it according to our feelings regardless of how dysphoric those feelings may be. And this is important because this is a new cultural language that has been used within the LGBT community, but now we are being... Um, brought into this type of language as well. We are not born with orientations. 
such as a sexual orientation or a gender orientation. It's a new cultural concept and it is a lie. Orient or orientation means to adjust with relation to or bring into due relation to surroundings, circumstances, facts, or feelings. Another definition describes it this way. The determination of the relative position of something or some, someone, especially oneself. We don't determine our gender. It isn't an orientation. It's God-given as he's knitting us together in our mother's womb. We cannot skew objective thinking with subjective thinking when it comes to God and creation. An objective perspective is one that's not influenced by emotions or opinions or personal feelings. It's a perspective based in fact, things quantifiable and things measurable. That's objective. Subjective is a perspective that is open to greater interpretation based on personal feelings, emotions, and aesthetics. So how do we look at gender objectively and not subjectively, or better yet, how do we teach our children to look at gender objectively and not subjectively and let them know there is no such thing as orientation because that's a very popular word in their young adult language. Objectively, we would say that a baby born with male genitalia is male and a baby born with female genitalia and organs is female. A subjective way to identify gender would be to say that gender is not about genitalia. It's about how someone feels, whether you feel male or female or any of the other identities. That's why we cannot, cannot, cannot separate sex from gender like many are trying to do in our culture. Our sexual organs determine our gender. And God made our bodies with intention and his intentions are good. Our bodies declare our sex. It's not something that's assigned, like many trans people state. Well, I was assigned female at birth, but I identify as male. It's not assigned. It's God-given, and it's given with intention. Even if something horrendous has happened to your body, and you want to be outside of that body because the thought of it brings so much pain and trauma, God is still good. God is still good, and he wants to walk you through that hurt and that pain. Our sex is determined at conception. As God is knitting us together in our mother, mother's womb, it's in our cells, it's in our DNA, and it's in our chromosomes. There are over 6,500 6, genetic differences between a man and a woman. 6,500 genetic differences between a man and a woman. So with that, Maleness isn't only anatomy, but anatomy shows that a male is an, a male and the same with female anatomy. Men and women are more than just their anatomy, but they are never less. So when we try to step outside of God's intent, we are in essence bucking against his authority. And doesn't that sound like what happened in the garden with Adam and Eve and that little nasty serpent? Oh, I can't stand him. He really did a number on my life for the first 36 years of my life. So Adam and Eve, they wanted to be like God, right? They weren't content in the way God created them. They wanted more as if God was holding something back from them. And just because they wanted to be like God or become their own God doesn't mean that was going to happen. It's outside of reality. So just because a man might desire to be a woman or vice versa doesn't mean that's going to happen regardless of taking hormones or even having sex reassignment surgery. Andrew T. Walker says this in his book, and this is a really good book, God and the Transgender Debate. He says this, you can change your form, but you can't change your formatting. In truth, there is no such thing as transgender because you cannot change your gender. The word exists, but not the reality it seeks to describe. And I was trying so hard to change it. I was trying so hard. And the more I was trying, the more discouraged I became because I knew there was nothing I could do to be fully the man I wanted to be. I wanted to I didn't want to have to do surgery to, to rearrange my body to become a man. I wanted it at birth, and I was so angry that I didn't get that. 
So what do we do with all this? How do we live life with people who sincerely see their gender with a subjective perspective? Well, the first thing we have to do is remember that we are dealing with broken, hurting people. People that were created in the image of God and he loves them exactly the same way he loves us because God shows no partiality. We have to remember how dirty and nasty we were when we were wallowing in our sin. Because there's really, even if you were a very moral person, because there's a lot of moral people in hell right now because they didn't accept the free gift of Jesus Christ. So I found in my own life that when I experienced, I had uh, experiencing something that, that I knew was obviously wrong, like the same-sex attraction or, or gender confusion that I had, but I didn't know what to do with it. I felt shame and confusion, and that always makes us run from God, right? Even though I didn't know him because nobody took the time to tell me the truth. But if we look at Adam and Eve, that when they sinned against God in the garden, the first emotion they experienced was shame. Shame of their nakedness, so they hid from God or, or they ran from him. So whether you have gender dysphoria or some other type of dysphoria, and dysphoria simply means a state of unease or dissatisfaction with an aspect of your life. If you don't cling to the one who renews your life, Jesus, you'll always be running from God and you'll always be in a state of shame. And that's where the depression and the suicidal ideation comes from. And if somebody would remind me during the Q&A to talk about depression and suicide, I would love to share more about that. So somebody type it in or something, if you wouldn't mind, please. And we, we, when we run from God, our only hope, when we run from God, our only hope is to take matters into our own hands. And that's what I did for years. And that's what transgender people do. They want freedom from their dysphoria because it is a horrendous feeling. They want freedom from their deep dissatisfaction and believe the only way to that freedom is through identifying in the opposite sex that their bodies declare they are. And they go to really big means to get there. And the suicide rate for those after they transition, even after surgery, is even higher than those from before transitioning because the dysphoria is still there. It may be relieved for a while, the first year or two, but then it comes back because they realize I've totally changed my whole body and I still have it because it's a heart issue. And sometimes there's some mental challenges there and that's not being addressed when they go to the doctor. They just get their testosterone shots or their estrogen shots and, and go on their way. So we need to have compassion. And if we keep in mind that we're all the same with just different manifestations of how our own sin plays out from our hurts and pain and even our pride, we will then have a heart of compassion for those who are still caught in their sin. We have to point people to Jesus. We have to point people to Jesus, to the cross of redemption. Listen, we have to point people there. We will not win people by arguing over their feelings. Never. It's a ridiculous thought to even have. But what we can do is we can be compassionate. Listen, being compassionate doesn't mean you're agreeing with someone living in sin. We're compassionate. Because Jesus calls us to be. Colossians 3, 12 through 14 says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all things, put on love. It's the bond of perfection. You want to look perfect? Because we transition sometimes too, right? We get uh, uh, 
breast augmentations. We tattoo eyebrows on our face. We get our lips injected because we don't like what we see in the mirror, right? You want to look in the mirror and see someone that's perfect? Put on love. It's the bond of perfection. Also in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, it says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time or making the most of the time that you have before you. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So these verses tell us to be tender and kind and humble, long-suffering, peaceable, gentle, and loving with the speech that's full of grace. And what happens when we do that? Why would God call us to do that? Well, 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26 tells us how we are to treat people, and it tells us why God calls us to be gentle and humble. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. So there's the how, there's the how we're supposed to be, and here comes the why. Why? if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. We can't just tell people, hey, what you're doing is wrong or what you're feeling is wrong and then expect them to change and no longer have these deep-seated issues. We can't expect people who don't know Jesus to act the way the Bible says to. It's hard enough for us to do that. We have the spirit of the living God inside of us. They need to hear the gospel. It's the gospel that changes a person and makes them a new creation in Christ Jesus. They need to be ministered to with both grace and truth. So how do you share the gospel with someone that seems so far away from it? I believe... The first step is just taking the time to get to know someone. Be personal, like Jesus, like he was with the woman at the well. But at that, at that same time, being compassionate doesn't mean we keep silent. It would not be compassionate to keep silent about the truth just so that you can show grace. Pastor David Whiting says this about grace and truth, and I love this quote. If we are full of truth, but we lack grace, truth gets distorted and grace gets lost. But if we're full of grace and not full of truth, then grace gets distorted and the truth gets lost. My generation, it was truth only, big truth bombs, bam, truth, truth, truth. And so that like our kids, you know, like the the 20s and early 30-year-olds, they are like, okay, so I'm hearing mom and dad say this truth, and this is the truth that they're saying about all things LGBT, they're gross, they're pedophiles, stay away from them, all this stuff. And then those kids went to school, and people started coming out more, and they're like, wait, these people that I've met in in high school or in college, they're really neat people. They're actually the only people, maybe it's high school, yeah, this gay guy, he's the only one who actually sit with me at lunch and have a conversation with me. These are really nice people. So they became, the millennials became the grace only generation, right? A lot of progressive Christianity is for that age group. So it's all grace, 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 and well, truth is relative. So I'm confident that your kids, this next generation, is going to be the perfect combo of both grace and truth because John 1.14 says that Jesus was filled with both grace and truth. And if he was filled with grace and truth, we can be too because we have the spirit of the living God inside of us and we have the word of God. We have everything we need to be filled with Grace and truth. And if you don't start with grace, they're not going to be willing to hear the truth. It doesn't say he was filled with truth and grace. It says he was filled with grace and truth. So what do we do in our schools and in our workplaces? And we see this obvious push toward the world um, welcoming and even more so now promoting the acceptance of all things transgender. First and foremost, I believe we have to meet this with prayer and fasting because this is a spiritual battle. It's from the pit of hell. I believe that I don't understand eschatology-wise, the Second Thessalonians chapter 2, where it does talk about God's going to send strong delusion. But the way we're thinking now is nothing short of delusional. 
that when a baby's born, you don't write down their sex, now gender. You wait till they get older and decide themselves. That is delusional. That doctors are coming and saying this. They're medical. They know the body. They know anatomy. They know biology. And they're like, yeah, yeah, let your kid pick it themselves when they get old enough. Delusional. Second Thessalonians also talks about that they didn't, they were believing the lie because they didn't have a love for the truth. Look it up yourselves. Doesn't say they didn't know the truth, because a lot of people in the LGBT community were raised in the church. So they know the truth, but 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says they didn't have a love for the truth. And I believe that's where we are now. So we have to deal with this with prayer and fasting. I think a lot of us have moved away from fasting, not because we're not spiritual enough, but just because we have access to food so easily now and we have a lot of cravings and the things we eat with all the junk that's in it makes us want bad food even more. It's, even I'm saved 18 years now. When I first got saved, I fasted all the time and I've seen through the years how that's kind of dwindled away because Reese peanut butter cups are really good you know, or, or whatever it might be. We need to get back to prayer and fasting. The enemy of our souls is trying to disfigure the very essence of how God created us. And there's no way to make sense of this, of what's happening in our culture, unless it was spiritual. We remember those statistics in the video, right? Those numbers are staggering, staggering. So privately in our own homes, as well as with other believers, we have to handle this with fervent prayer. But when we're not with believers, I think we need to handle it with objective reasoning and not religion when we're dealing with our schools and workplaces. Because once we bring God into the conversation, people stop listening and begin judging us as bigoted hypocrites. And that gets us nowhere. So use in your home, be uh, use that subjective reasoning, we'll say, in our homes, be pr praying and fasting, and in the open square, use objective reasoning. Because of what's happening in our schools, the things public schools are teaching our children in the name of sex education or health class or whatever it's called now is morally and sexually abusive. It is sexual abuse. And it needs to be addressed as that. Children are being sexually frightened or sexually aroused. Both are wrong and both are sexual abuse. Now we get 400 kids in one building and teach them this junk in the, in the name of curriculum. And it's now it's 400 kids in the same building being sexually abused at the same time. From the pit of hell. And because our school administrations are saying that these classes are board approved and state approved, parents feel silenced. But we will not be silenced. We have to fight, fight, fight this. Your kids are being abused. Prayer, fasting, and fighting. And when we go to the school, we fight it with objective reasoning. And we can maybe talk about that in, in the Q&A. So when your child comes home from school, check their backpack and their computer. Tell them you want to see every handout, even though they probably don't do handouts anymore. Every piece of homework that they have or what they learned that day, however you need to access that from them, tell them you need to see it. High school and middle school children are being given material that's nothing short of pornography with pictures, and they have to study it and even be tested on it. Some schools uh, use, including elementary schools, um, this material, it's either the gender-bred person or the gender unicorn to show children what gender is by using a childlike diagram, and it shows gender coming from the brain and heart and not from the genitalia. And they're learning it in school, so they're going to believe it. And whatever your kids hear first is what they believe. So you have to be the one to start the conversation maybe even before they go to kindergarten or at least first grade because they might go to kindergarten and their best friend might be Billy and when they get to first grade, Billy might be like, hi, my name is Susie now. We have to have the conversations. I'm sorry, I'm sorry you guys have to have these conversations with your kids. It breaks my heart. But if they don't hear truth from your, you first, they're going to hear the deception from the world and they're going to believe it and then you're backtracking. 
Many of your kids, when they come home, they're not even going to tell you what material they've been exposed to because they're overwhelmed or embarrassed by that. And because of that, they keep silent out of fear. And that's exactly what someone does who's been sexually violated. They keep silent out of fear. So mom and dad, sit down and talk to your child. Let your child ask questions without them seeing fear on your face. That's really, really important. And you might be the one that has to initiate the conversation. And of course, the conversation will be guided by their age. Keep it simple if they're real young. Tell them God made people. And he made them male and female. And there's no variation to that. And I suggest reading Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 as a family at least once a month to counteract the lies that they're hearing from culture. I suggest it once a week, but you know your child and, and how they receive Please read Genesis 1, 2, and 3 as a family together as often as you can. And then through that, as you're teaching them the truth, then you can tell them that some people are confused and don't like the way that God made them, so they wish they, they were the opposite sex, but they might grow out of that. Let them know that no one can actually change from one sex to another, even though they might try. And it might seem like a silly thing to tell them, but you have to tell them that because culture is telling them something otherwise. And school is telling them something otherwise. Their friends are telling them something otherwise. And then they get a phone and <laughs> that's just telling them all kinds of crazy. And Brad's going to share that with us. Then ask them if there's anyone like that at school. And if they say yes, ask them how that makes them feel. And then minister to them accordingly. Don't say, well, you know, that's wrong that that kid is doing that initially. You can ease into that. But if they say, yeah, there is someone like that in school, then you just say, honey, how does that make you feel? Because it's affected them. So you need to know how it makes them feel. And then together, you and your child pray for that classmate of theirs. So your child sees how you handle things when situations come up that you know is outside of God's will. Encourage your child to keep an open dialogue with you about any questions that they might have and remind them that you won't be upset with them for asking. This is important, you guys. They need to know that you're a safe place for them to talk these things out without you being visibly angry over what they are experiencing at school. They can read your face. If they see you get upset, they might be afraid to share anything with you after that. Listen, your tone and attitude will make an impact on how they see broken and hurting people. In the, the uh, Bible study last night, he shared that as well. They see how you respond to things. So take this opportunity to affirm them in their own gender because with all their hearing and seeing, they might be questioning their own identity even if you don't think that there's a possibility of that happening. There's a thing called rapid onset gender dysphoria. We can talk about it uh, out at my table or during Q&A. And it's not different for your older children. They might just have more exposure, like the high school kids, than the younger ones. But they still need to know that you're a safe place for them to come and ask questions to without you being visibly angry. If you need to go in, in your bedroom or go for a drive after that conversation and scream at the top of your lungs, do it then. But not in front of your kids. And please understand this, all of our children are experiencing this gender indoctrination, all of them. The only difference between Christian and public, well, not the only difference, a big difference between Christian and public schools is that Christian school kids hide their sin and public school kids display it. I can't cover everything in this time allotted, but I have a table in the back a list of helpful info, and of course we have the time of Q&A, and my website is outofegyptministries.org. I have cards out at the table just with a QR code. You can scan it. You can keep it on your phone so it's easy to pull up, outofegyptministries.org. I've put as much info there as I possibly could to help you out, even counseling ministries. I don't counsel, but hopefully that can direct you to a ministry. Maybe you or your child needs counsel. And I want to close with this. Win the person, not the battle. Because the battle's not yours. Win the person, not the battle. The battle is the Lord's. Stand up for truth and righteousness, but do it with love 
and grace. Because most transgender people aren't the six foot five cross dressing man you see with an orange wig and circus makeup all over your face reading stories in the library. Or maybe like some of the pictures we saw in the video. Many are broken and in desperate, desperate need of love. And we're the ones that carry that love. We're the ones that have agape love. Everything else is phileo or storge or the other kinds of love. We carry the agape love. And what better place to receive that love than in the body of Christ sitting in these chairs? Because who knows what God will do them? Who knows what, what salvation and sanctification lies ahead for them? They just might end up one day speaking at a parent conference at a church in Chino Valley, building up the body of Christ and giving them a better understanding of where they came from.